Well, welcome everyone to the Australian National University and our Big Picture series. It's part of the 2020 ANU Crawford Leadership Forum. My name is Sean Innes and I lead the Public Policy and Societal Impact Hub at ANU. I am joining you from Canberra, the traditional lands of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people, and I'd like to pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. And I'd like to extend those respects to the Elders of the more than 300 nations that call Australia home. Today's event is focused on climate change in a post-pandemic world. In looking at the pandemic and what we've learned from it, there are three features that I think are relevant to today's discussion. The first is that in response to a global threat, nations have acted quickly and decisively, or at least most nations. They have put their economies into hibernation and restricted social freedoms that many hold dear. Very stringent uh, reactions from governments in many nations. In doing so, They've accepted a level of short-term pain and change to protect health and longer-term economic prospects. The second feature is that action was not part of a globally coordinated response, but nations acting individually in their best interests, their duty to protect their own citizens rather than some conception of the global interest has driven behaviour. The third, is that the direction of, that the world now takes is heavily dependent on new technology coming to the rescue. For the pandemic, it's in the form of a treatment or a vaccine. For climate change, it's in the form of zero or very low emissions technologies. So what does all this mean for our efforts to tackle climate change globally and here in Australia? To answer that, we've got a wonderful panel chaired by ANU's own Ken, Professor Ken Baldwin, Director of the Energy Change Institute here at ANU. A final reminder for those watching live, please submit your questions using the Q&A function in your toolbar. And with that, I'd love to hand over to Ken to lead the panel. Bye for now. Thank you very much, Sean. And uh, I would also uh, like to pay my respects to the traditional owners of the land where I join you from today, the Nambri and Ngunnawal people. We'll try and go through as many of your questions uh, on the Q&A tab as we can today. We'll acknowledge you by name and city if you include that in the start of the question. Uh, otherwise, uh, questions will be asked anonymously. Uh, so let's uh, now start uh, by joining and welcoming me uh, with me, our speakers today. Uh, we have, first of all, Joe Evans from the Department of Industry, Science, Energy and Resources. Uh, second, we have Emma Hurd, Investor Group on Climate Change. And third, we have Andrew Liveris, former chairman and CEO of the Dow Chemical Company. So welcome to my panel. Uh, and just to start things off, uh, let me remind you of uh, the uh, effects of the COVID-19 crisis uh, on the planet more broadly. Uh, we've all seen uh, the economic downturn, uh, the, uh, the suffering of humanity, uh, and of course, uh, the effects of this on uh, the wider global emissions. Uh, we know uh, from uh, measurements that uh, emissions uh, fell dramatically. Um, on April uh, the 7th, uh, they actually fell uh, by 17% more than any other day in the first four months of 2020. So things by that stage uh, had uh, changed dramatically. Uh, and what we are seeing uh, now is that uh, uh, emissions have, have dropped uh, by well over 10% uh, and that uh, we have now reached a point where we have the equivalent emissions that were recorded back in 2006. So this has been an enormous change. Uh, and of course, this has had other consequences. Uh, for example, uh, in some parts of India, people have seen the Himalayas for the first time. Uh, because of the, uh, the reduction in pollution and the clarity of the air, for example, which also reflects the reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. 
So this is a dramatic change in the planet. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, the question is, uh, what will happen uh, when uh, we come out of the COVID-19 uh, period and move into the recovery phase? Uh, and so I'd like to start the discussion today with our panel by asking the question, will the lowering of emissions during the pandemic be wiped out by the following rebound? And uh, I'd like to ask Jo Evans if uh, she'd like to give her perspective on that question. Thanks, Ken. Um, and I just want to say thank you uh, for the opportunity to be on the panel with Emma and uh, Andrew. It's a great privilege and, and an important topic. Um, look, to answer the question, will, it, will the, the reductions be wiped out? You have to actually think about what's happening uh, in the atmosphere with our emissions. And so any reduction in emissions over a period of time, just like what we've seen over the last couple of months, are going to uh, make a contribution to having a lower stock of emissions in the atmosphere um, going forward. The only thing that could wipe that gain out would be if emissions not only came back up to where they were trending before um, COVID-19 started, but actually went beyond that and, and increased um, above where we had ever expected them to be before. That would be the only way this gain that we have seen, this sort of fortuitous gain of an otherwise horrible experience um, uh, would be wiped out. But we are looking at what's happening in Australia and you definitely see the kinds of trends that, that Ken was describing at a global level, you're also seeing here. Uh, so we've looked at, for example, in the electricity sector, if you look at April and May of this year, compared to 2019, there was a 1.4 million tonne reduction in the amount of emissions coming from our electricity sector, which is about a 5% drop. Um, in the transport sector, uh, that drop was more like 27%. Uh, so we've seen nearly, nearly um, 6 million tonnes come out of the transport sector just in those couple of months. But you've got to think about, well, well so what's happening in those sectors? Um, our electricity sector was already on a trend downwards. So it's very unlikely that the emissions are going to rebound anywhere back up to something higher than what they were before. Um, for transport, on the other hand, that's an area of our emissions that has always been growing for, you know, it has, hasn't started any sort of a trend downwards yet. So you would expect that the emissions will come all the way back up to so where we expected them to be before, but again, probably not go higher than that again. So you do see emissions sort of come back up to trends. And we saw that after the global financial crisis as well back in 2008, nine. Um, and, and you see reports back about very rapid, in fact, record um, growth in emissions coming out of some of those periods. And we will probably see rapid growth in emissions again coming out of this one. But that doesn't mean that they are um, wiping out the gains. It just means they're kind of returning back to normal. Um, and I think really the question that we're trying to get at here is, you know, has it been a good thing that emissions dropped? Um, and can we capture that gain um, and, and take it forward with us? And we've just got to be a little bit careful about that one because um, as the IEA has said in their report that just came out this morning and many others are commenting on, the gains or the emissions reductions that we've seen are really mostly about economic activity. Um, they're not um, really coming from the sort of structural changes that we want to see to get really systemic um, shifts in our emissions trajectory. And, you know, we've all sort of experienced either personally, directly or through our friends and family, we're just watching what's happening uh, in the economy, the, the, the really substantial costs that have been associated with having this level of emissions. And so you sort of say, is this the most effective way of us reducing our emissions? And you'd, you'd have to say no. We want that economic activity to recover and we want to find the more effective way of, ways of reducing our systemic emissions over time. So, um, so will, they, will the gains be wiped out? No. Do we have some opportunities to look for new ways of introducing low emissions technologies and so on as we go forward? Absolutely, as we think about recovery. So I'll leave it at that, Kim. Great, thank you very much, Joe. Would anybody else in the panel like to uh, say something about the possibility of a rebound? Ken, if it's all right, I might just add yep. one thing that I didn't say and I should have. Um, I mentioned electricity and transport, but there's actually been quite a number of other sectors in the economy where we're not seeing, at least in Australia, not seeing any substantial shift in those emissions. So if you think about the agriculture sector, um, because the mo most of that shift downwards in the others come from economic activity, you wouldn't have expected to see much change in agriculture and that's what we're seeing. So, so, so for some sectors, that sort of rebound effect won't even happen <coughs> because they've been travelling through. Cheers. Indeed, and, and in fact, uh, agriculture is rebounding from the drought, so uh, you wouldn't necessarily expect to see a decrease anyway. So uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's certainly true. 
now, I guess, you know, given that, uh, that things have changed dramatically around the world uh, and it's really captured uh, the globe's attention in terms of addressing a, uh, a, uh, a significant threat to uh, the human race, uh, is this uh, COVID-19 uh, crisis perhaps an opportunity to refocus our attention on another grave global threat to the human race, uh, and that is climate change. And indeed, uh, as Joe's hinted, uh, as we come out uh, of this uh, recession and we reconfigure the way that economies work, is there an opportunity uh, to do that reconfiguring in a way that helps us to uh, address climate change. So uh, maybe I could ask Andrew Liveris if he'd like to comment on that question. Yeah, thank you, Ken. I, um, so I would say to you that that question um, has been in the making now for a couple decades. And when in my prior life as heading a large global enterprise, if I looked at the three tectonic shifts that were going on that affected all of humanity and integrating them into the value system, of any enterprise, including the one I used to run, uh, globalization, digitalization, and the effects humanity was having on the planet. And as a consequence of that, what could one do to minimize the footprint of all of us at 7 billion people on the planet? Stressing the planet, the third trend, or sustainability, as the United Nations unleashed its SDG goals and put them out there, if you think about the uh, consequences of managing the science behind the indicators of stress in the planet, of course, the effect on the environment and the effect on uh, the atmosphere and the effect climate change is being uh, putting on the planet scientifically is something that's been debated endlessly by institutions. And uh, unless we do something about them like the Paris Accords, nothing will tend to get done. That it's a long runway item. The pandemic, has brought a short runway item right to our doorstep, literally. The pandemic also science-based, also predicted, also part of every enterprise's enterprise resource management program. Everyone knew about it, the science was there, yet very little was done. Even with the warning signals of SARS and MERS and H5N1 and the avian influenza, humanity did nothing really about it. So why, why is that true and why, what can we do now that we've seen the uh, COVID-19 pandemic unleash itself on us, on humanity? What is this saying? Literally, is the planet talking to us? And is humanity having now to respond to these three tectonic trends coming all at once, all together in a different way? And I would say the thesis of the case and the proof of the case have just collided. This crisis is now giving us an opportunity to do what we have really been very loath to do, which is to rethink and redo our global institutions. Globalization is actually, per the 1950s and the Marshall Plan, failing. Uh, Western democracies no longer want to lead. Western democracies don't even get together and coordinate anymore. And of course, what we've seen in the United States is the poster child of that, but not just that. And I would say to you that what's happening as a result of globalization failing to keep the global institutions relevant, and we've seen examples of that just now with WHO, it really does bring to the fore that what is humanity going to do to respond to the climate change issue that it can learn from not being able to respond to the pandemic? And I would say to you that the answer is starting to actually unfold before us. Uh, humanity is responding in a very interesting way. It's responding nationally. And in, in some cases, and if you take a look at the way Australia has responded to the crisis, even responding at the local and state level, economic nationalism and society and citizens coming together to put in place safeguards for their citizens, even though we don't like the ramification of division around the world with failure of global institutions, the remaking of global institutions is going to come by summing the best practices around the world to responses like the responses to COVID and figuring our way on how to make our societies, our citizens safer and better as a result. So responsible nations like Australia have to step up. What we are basically doing in this country is saying, I am looking after my citizens. I have to take care of my economy. I have to have the term just transition to minimize the effect 
of my activities on my country and as a consequence, my planet. And then when institutions get rebuilt around the world, as we you know, look at G20, as we look at G7, as we look at G11, whatever G you wanna say, I'd say the G0 we're all suffering from right now, the lack of global leadership, means let's take care of what we need to do as a standard setter and a standard bearer to enable a just transition. And therefore, put in place fiscal policies of the long-term kind that governments have been loath to do because governments come and go and short-termism has taken over everything. How can we put in place fiscal policies to stand the test of time? And as far as I'm concerned, that means government and private sector have to work like never before to develop answers to the marriage of minimizing the effect of my citizens, helping my country be the standard bearer. As a consequence of that, I think we need the role of government as our government is doing to actually start to embrace all the opinions and inputs of all of our sectors of society and put in place reforms for the national good, for the sovereign good. Which, what does that mean? A sustainable energy policy, a sustainable industrial policy, a sustainable digital policy, a sustainable policy that actually lifts our quality of life not degrades it for all of our citizens. I think that type of bigger government, as much as it's been anathema to the private sector for so long, the rule book of the 21st century means it's required. We cannot use the rule book of the 20th century to solve these problems. And for me, that means that climate change now comes to the fore as a result of this pandemic, not to the back. And by the way, the earlier question that you asked, Joe, and I would say to you, I'd agree, economic creativity will rebound. And if we don't step in and set the new rule book in place, we will see the same emissions we had pre-COVID. And I, I don't know when, two or three or four years, that means no learning. We need to intervene now and grab the learning and then make the just transition accelerate, not decelerate. Thank you, Andrew. And, and that raises a very interesting question, which is that, uh, you know, in the face of crisis, uh, people around the world have turned to government uh, for help and, and for guidance. Uh, and this perhaps has brought about a new form of social contract, at least in some countries. In other countries, things start to be, you know, a little ragged around the edges. But in many countries, I think what we're finding is a new form of social contract where uh, the, uh, you know, the, the non-government sector and the government sector are working much more closely together, as you indicate they need to. Uh, and, uh, and as you say, that there is a prospect for carrying that forward and dealing with other serious issues like climate change. So a uh, very interesting uh, perspective on, on, uh, on the shift in social contract that we're seeing. Um, so maybe now we should turn our attention uh, from the global uh, 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 societal issues to, to Australia and, and, and look at um, how uh, the, uh, the, the climate change uh, discussion, particularly around uh, policy and, uh, and social contract, uh, might change uh, in Australia following the post-COVID-19 uh, world. Uh, and uh, Joe, again, maybe uh, you could perhaps give us a perspective on that. Yeah, I'll just kick us off. Um, because I guess I want to still go back to this idea that uh, you know, what we've seen in terms of that big emissions reduction now has really been about economic activity and what, what we really need to achieve to get sustained um, emissions reductions are the sort of more systemic changes um, to the way that we produce energy, to the way that we behave as individuals, how much we're driving our cars, all those things are still, they're very, they're very difficult. Um, and, and the reason I just put that in context is because there's quite a lot of things um, in terms of the way that we will talk about climate change in Australia that are gonna stay the same after COVID, as well as there being obviously some new um, opportunities to, to, to promote a discussion about, well, what, what are the industries that we are trying to support um, as we uh, recover and how do we position ourselves so that those industries got the best chance of being the sort of low emissions things of the future like hydrogen and so on. Um, so if I come back to, so what are the things that are still the same? I mean, the Australian government, and I, I kind of note Andrew's point about global institutions, but um, we are dealing with a, a, a 
a big, you know, a, a wicked, wicked issue in climate change. And I think the global agreement that's there under Paris is incredibly important to um, enabling countries to take the actions that they need to take. Because unlike, um, sorry, we'll come back to the question, Ken. Because un unlike COVID, where you can take a very nationalistic approach, because if you close your own boundaries and you can, the, the, the actions that you take as a nation can very directly affect your risk. Um, that's not the case in climate change. So for Australia, it wouldn't matter if we completely shut off our emissions tomorrow, the kinds of impacts that we would feel as a result of climate change would probably still be exactly the same. So there isn't that kind of very quick cause and effect um, uh, kind of relationship that you have seen in the COVID crisis. So we're still in a world of needing definitely to have a global united coalition, you know, coalition of action that um, actually gets to the, the long-term goals that we're after. Um, and that hasn't changed. It was there before COVID, it's there now. We still need to get global emissions down to the kind of levels that will enable us to stay well under two degrees and make as best efforts as we can to get to keep temperature rises to less than 1.5. That's unchanged. The Australian government's commitment to that is unchanged. And the kinds of things that the government already has in place, um, so if you think about uh, the work that's being done on the technology roadmap, uh, the support that's being given to purchasing emissions uh, reductions from the community and from business through the Emissions Reduction Fund and the limitations that are put on excessive emissions growth through the safeguard mechanism. All of these things are already in place to try to create the systemic changes um, that we need over time in Australia to bring emissions down, but still maintain a really vibrant, prosperous economy and um, regions and jobs and all of the other things that are important to us um, as a society. So um, in some ways that hasn't, you know, again, I was sort of saying there are lots of things that aren't going to change. The, the bones of what we're going to do on climate policy are already in place. Um, I think what we've got post COVID is a real opportunity to use those existing structures to find the opportunities to, to see some gains um, on emissions reductions that we might not have had the opportunity to do before. Not, not because um, in the crisis an industry closed down and we don't want to start it up again. I don't think that's the kind of outcome we're looking for. What we're, what we're saying is if you're going to be investing in new things and supporting new things to grow, let's have a look at where the opportunities are um, for things that not only stimulate the economy and provide jobs and regional benefits and so on and productivity growth, but where are the things that can also contribute to, to lower emissions. Um, so I'm pretty optimistic that, um, you know, the government has already said um, it wants to take a technology based approach. It doesn't want to be compelling or forcing or regulating things to happen. It's interested in creating um, the opportunity for voluntary action by companies and by individuals to, to try to keep our emissions um, on a, on a downwards trajectory. Um, and I'm pretty confident that that's still um, the way that things will unfold. Um, and maybe just as a last, um, a last comment on that is you do see quite a lot of movement. You know, you've got a lot of industries already taking a lot of active, you know, I put, I put the Climate Active banner behind me um, intentionally. There's a lot of companies that are already seeing um, that this is the long-term future. Um, so you've already got um, trends all pointing in the right direction. And I think all we need to do is make sure that our recovery programs so don't get in the way um, of those trends, because it is really important that we continue to move emissions down at a rate and a pace that our economy can properly adjust to and that we can continue to have good, um, safe, reliable energy as well as we do that. Great, well, thank you very much, Joe. Uh, okay, well, let's now think about how this might work coming out of the, of the uh, COVID-19 recession. Uh, I'd like to paint two contrasting scenarios in the next two questions. Uh, the first, a kind of optimistic one that, you know, we could, uh, uh, you know, invest in a different way to spend our way out of the recession. The other in a more pessimistic one that says, well, you know, we've had this terrible economic shock, so things aren't going to go well in any sector, let alone in uh, sectors that relate to, to doing something about climate change. So let me ask the first question then, and um, maybe Emma could, uh, could uh, provide her perspective on this. Uh, so the question is, uh, if we're going to have an investment led let's say green recovery, a bit like the Green Deal that's uh, being proposed in, in some countries. Uh, and, you know, focus on things like investment in renewables, uh, new export industries, which not only uh, address uh, climate change uh, in one nation, but address climate change across the world. And Australia is well placed. We're a global energy powerhouse already. So 
Is there a, a way of Australia spending its way out of recession that will provide us uh, with the, um, the, the tools, the investment, the infrastructure that we need to pivot to a more sustainable future? Do you think that pathway uh, is an option that we, uh, we are going to take, Emma? Thanks, Ken. And um, just before I uh, get into the question, also just wanted to take a quick moment to uh, acknowledge the traditional owners of the land from which I'm joining you today at the ANU, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. Um, and I, in answering that question, I'm also going to try and just pick up on a couple of the other themes that have been mentioned so far, because I had to resist the temptation to dive in and, 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 and get involved in some of those conversations, because it's been a really rich conversation so far in terms of so many issues being raised. And I guess I want to think about it in two ways. Um, firstly, I want to talk about, you know, what else has been going on during the recovery that relates to climate change? And then secondly, how this relates to the investment ask as we begin to look at what are the short, medium and long-term investment requirements of recovery from COVID? So what else has been going on in climate change at the same time, the last six months that we've all been in lockdown and working from home, in addition to the, the drop in emissions in some of those key industry sectors? Well, we're still seeing the physical effects of climate change itself. It's actually not that long since most of Australia was on fire in terms of the actual bushfires over summer. We do have the Royal Commission working away in terms of looking at the impacts of the physical effects of climate change in Australia. But we also are seeing unprecedented heat conditions in other parts of the world, you know, places like Siberia that have never experienced an Australian summer um, and, and are basically kind of dealing with these impacts. So the actual increasing effects and costs of climate change itself continue to be felt, even as we're seeing these short-term drop-offs in emissions and these sort of changes in our everyday working lives as well. We also know that carbon risk remains a financial risk, no matter what investment decisions we make. While we've been in lockdown in the last few weeks, um, in particular, the, the network for greening the financial system, the international collaboration of financial regulators has published their own guidance on uh, um, obligations for financial supervisors in integrating climate change into their supervisory duties. That work is also continuing. They're also publishing a further guidance on scenario analysis around how regulated financial entities should be managing for climate change on both the physical and the transition side. So that work is continuing. We also know that um, investor pressure on companies has not diminished and expectations of companies has not diminished around climate change during this period. Um, in the last few months, we've seen shareholder resolutions at companies such as Woodside and Santos above 40 and 50% on climate related issues. We've never seen votes that high and it happened during COVID, during the lockdown, when some would argue that we should have seen a divergence away from focus on climate change issues. We've also seen companies publishing their own commitments to um, transitioning to net zero by 2050. Uh, even this week, Fortescue publishing their own commitment to net zero, that hasn't gone away. Uh, and even in terms of um, integrating how this will work alongside the drop-off in demand in some of our key commodities. You know, recent comments from BP around changes in terms of the valuation of their reserves and some of their assets, um, responding to these kind of structural changes that are happening concurrently uh, in terms of COVID impacts, um, supply and demand dynamics, and climate change decarbonisation trends. All of these things are happening at the same time, and investors don't have the choice of choosing whether they respond to climate change or they look at investment requirements around uh, economic recovery post COVID. You actually have to be integrating climate change into every and all investment decisions that you make, no matter the context, because of the fact that we know, as Andrew correctly pointed out, decarbonisation is one of the defining investment themes of the 21st century. It will fundamentally change every industry sector uh, and investors are very alive to the fact that you have to be managing for climate change in all of your investment decisions. So I guess it's, the way I think about it is, is it a choice between a green recovery or something else? What is that something else? Does it even exist? Are we having a false debate? Are we actually talking about any kind of economic recovery has to incorporate these sorts of carbon trends that we're seeing? Uh, and is it a little bit of misdirection to say that we should be forced to choose when in actual fact we have no choice? We have to be integrating climate change factors into our, all of our investment decisions. I guess just in terms of a couple of other points I would make in terms of what does that look like. There's no shortage of debate and discussion happening in Australia or internationally, but what does that look like in reality? Um, what does that look like in reality, in particular for very carbon intensive economies like Australia, 
that are also trade exposed exporting nations uh, into global markets um, as well. So how do we integrate these sorts of considerations into our um, discussions and debates that we need to be having quickly but robustly and comprehensively and inclusively around what kind of recovery do we actually want to have based on what kind of economy do we have and where do we know we need to get to. And I, um, Jane mentioned the IEA report that's come out. I think that's a really interesting signal that's been sent um, by the Energy Agency, also kind of identifying a lot of opportunities opportunities, a lot of um, clear priorities in terms of where some of that investment should be flowing if we want to both, um, uh, you know, look at investing in uh, long term recovery for our economy, also short term job creation to deal with the social implications of, of COVID and the economic shutdown, and also be, be managing for these um, macro structural issues to do with climate change that we have no choice that we have to be dealing with. Great, thank you very much, Emma. Uh, so now let's look at the. Um, and would you would it be okay if I just make one comment against um, for, with him on that topic as well? Because I think in some ways I'm agree. I, I will, and lots of ways agree with what Emma said. And, and and what I wanted to try to get at is that so many of the things that we would naturally choose to put into the portfolio of things that we will do to help our recovery will lead to better emissions outcomes. Like it's the way that technology has improved over the last decade or more. The things that are actually just natural economic choices anyway to drive this stuff. And because of the way we start to think about it, the fact that climate risk is being embedded so much more broadly in the way that um, governments and companies are thinking. I think there is a natural um, drift towards including the kinds of things um, that you wanna see in a recovery program to be there anyway. And we're already seeing it even here in Australia. So things like um, the focus in the home builder program, the fact that you're looking at get, getting people to renovate older homes to make them hopefully more energy efficient as they do it. Um, the fact that you've got investments in things like uh, the Marinus link, which can bring renewable energy from Tasmania up to, a, to the mainland. These things are already sort of appearing in our recovery program. Um, and it's not sort of because they're green, it's because they're good things to do for recovery and they happen to actually also lead to some great outcomes. So it's almost like there's a natural coalition of these things that's ready to be taken advantage of. Mm. And Gia, just to respond against that, I mean, I agree, but the problem is we have a COVID recovery discussion over here, we have a technology roadmap discussion over here, and in between we've got the market and capital markets saying, actually, we want to be going here in terms of how these, these trends are coming together. And in order to do that, in order to get that speed and the pace that we know we need to get, you also need a floor in terms of the things that we won't do, which are not aligned with those priorities. So I think bringing together those discussions is incredibly important um, and, and not having kind of parallel tracks where we hope that they come together because that's what the market wants, rather than deliberately deciding as a nation that is where we're going to go and that is where we're going to get to within particular timeframes as well. Okay, well, we might bring Andrew into the discussion now and uh, and talk about uh, maybe the, the sort of counterpoint to this uh, discussion. And that is that uh, maybe what we'll see is that uh, because of the economic shock that has happened during the COVID crisis, uh, that, uh, that many companies and indeed governments might uh, look at this and say, well, look, you know, this is uh, all well and good, but the main uh, game here is to get people back to work, uh, to get the economy going again, uh, and the climate side of things, it's a great thing to do, but it's all a bit too hard at the moment. We've got to focus on actually surviving in terms of an economy and a society. So is there a risk that uh, the COVID crisis uh, will be such a shock uh, to not only Australia, but other nations, uh, that this will stall much needed investment in decarbonisation? Yeah, the natural um, build on the previous point, I, I tried hard not to chime in because um, I was anticipating this other side of the conversation. Uh, I indicated before, and Emma was summarizing quite nicely, and the way I'll do it is the visual of the golden triangle. Um, the triangle has split apart, and what, what are the apexes of the triangle? Business, government, and civil society. And it's splitting apart on many topics. So look at the uh, racial riots and the civil justice and social justice reform required in countries like the United States, and in fact, many countries, including Australia. Um, if you look at values-based activities around the world and you know the various groups that are forming, uh, we are truly uh, splintering into tribal behaviours. Um, so as much as I want the Paris Accords to be the template, they won't be. Economic nationalism has arrived. And so how do you bring the capital markets, KPIs and indicators, performance indicators, 
with enterprise to suit the, the new requirements of civil society. And what civil society has been saying now for about a generation, certainly you know, the last 20 years, is, hey, what you've done to economic, economically colonize the planet has a ramification. And remember, there was a debt conversation that went with this in the 0809 crisis. So in other words, we're piling on too much debt. So, but now we have actual physical ramifications that have unfolded before us. The bushfires in Australia, as already articulated, was a very visible example of a physical phenomena that we had not seen in a generation. The pandemic is another one. The cost to GDP and the cost to jobs for governments is way higher than the investment roadmap required to risk mitigate these events occurring in the future. And that conversation needs to occur. The problem with the conversation is it's not occurring at global institutions effectively. Uh, WTO is failing, WHO is failing. So that's my previous point. So what we've got to do is create that golden triangle in our countries. We've got to actually get the ESG factors as part of shareholder and stakeholder responsibility in all of our public institutions and start insisting on how actually an affordable economic and energy transition can occur that actually minimizes the footprint of that enterprise on the planet. Forward-looking corporations are already doing it. My own co company, Dow, that I retired from, the CEO two days ago announced carbon neutrality by 2050 and full plastics uh, recycled by 2035. Now, we could argue with 2035 and 2050 is a long way away, but they're gonna hold themselves to account to their shareholders. And by the way, their shareholders, the Business Roundtable of America boldly put out a statement, and I was part of this when I was there, that says all stakeholders matter, not just the financial owner. As the financial owner becomes more responsible, and there are a lot of them doing that, impact investors, but they're still the vast majority, we, a minority, we still have hedge funds who are beating the drum for 90-day profit pictures. We still have activists who are trying to tear companies apart and not spend money on R&D. We still have a financial instrument out there where we have too much monetary policy intervening on it. the enterprises doing the right thing. Bold CEOs, bold boards are stepping up and putting in bold targets. We should, as a government, so back to the triangle, listen to the voice of civil society for the next generation. Of course, we care about the past generations, but going forward, how do we actually minimize the impact of all of human activity on the planet by not putting in metrics? You are you expect what you inspect is a famous saying. So we need these metrics put in and pushed on by the capital markets. We need governments to set the frameworks. Energy transition in this country, energy policy and environmental policy are two sides of the same coin, okay? They are much more or less the same thing. So house renovations and energy efficiency. We should have the best efficiency standards in the world so we don't burn an unnecessary gigajoule of energy at all, okay? We should optimize our fossil fuel mix so we transition to the lowest carbon emitter, ultimately hydrogen, when it's affordable. We should take our precious funds in our universities and CSIRO and invest them in the technologies of, the, of today and tomorrow as we build affordable renewables, as solar's come down, as winds come down. How do we get base load power down? How do we get base load to be hydro or hydrogen and carbon capture and storage? We need these technologies accelerated today. And then finally, how do we actually put a market signal that everyone's behavior changes accordingly? This is the famous carbon pricing mechanism that has obviously not gone well in the past year. I would venture to say it's not gone well because we've started backwards. We've started with the discussion on carbon pricing and not looked at those other three things I just discussed. This is not easy stuff. If it was easy stuff, it would have been solved already. We need to actually... Uh, golden triangle approach where the key components of that triangle get together and yes, by country and ultimately for the world so that we can actually put all those programs together in one big set of policy frameworks that survive change of government. That certainty, you will get investment like no tomorrow, even out of this pandemic because it's an infrastructure and a capability build for a lower impact on the planet to avert 
the disasters we've been going through. Can I just respond to that, Ken, as well? I mean, yep. just want to pick up on a couple of the things that Andrew's also said. Um, I, I guess I. Uh, I guess we have to ask the question, whenever I participate in these sorts of climate change discussions, no matter what the perspectives that people are coming from, we always tend to, seem to end up in a position of furious agreement around the trends, where we're going, what we need. And the question I always find myself thinking, if, if everybody recognises that that's where we need to go, why are we not moving there in a, in a, in, in a, at a fast pace in a way that's most economically beneficial to Australia? Why don't we have a carbon price? Um, why, um, why do we need a uh, technology investment roadmap with government intervention to pull through investment in technologies? Why do we not have an environment of investment certainty around, around climate and energy? What are the factors that have contributed to Australia being in a position where I think it's pretty widely acknowledged we have a fairly dysfunctional climate and energy debate at the national policy level? And if there's one thing, and you know, I, I think, yes, these issues are incredibly hard, it is also very hard to argue the national and the international at the same time in terms of pros and cons. It's also really hard to, in the moment, um, in, 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 in an environment where you do have demands for short-term returns, to argue for investment in long-term structural change and investment in new business opportunities. Yes, these things are all hard, but isn't that also where government has a key role to play in terms of building the golden triangle, as we've been talking about? Do we outsource outsource leadership in that sense? Do we wait for markets? Is it up to investors in the private sector to drive forward national policy agendas? And, and I guess where I'm going with this question is also, um, or, or to lobby against them as the case may be in terms of arguing not just for national interest, but also for company interest in any kind of policy shift as well, which is something we've seen a lot in Australia, obviously. I guess where the question I'm going is with COVID, COVID has not just disrupted our daily working lives and our economy, it's also disrupted some of the hardwired political positioning that we've seen at the national level. And, um, you know, is it unreasonable for us at this point to ask that if we can get that kind of unanimity in terms of uh, policy direction and um, uh, in the response to COVID, why can't we also take this opportunity perhaps of a fracturing a little bit of the hardwired positions at the national federal level to actually also look for some sort of breaking of the ice on climate and energy policy and actually begin to have a much more constructive policy discussion about what Australia needs to get to net zero by 2050. You know, why can't we make that our COVID priority as well? Uh, as also looking at um, short-term jobs creation in key industries, uh, because as, as Andrew has identified, they are intricately related. Yes, and, uh, and that's a, a, an interesting point to now move to the uh, discussion with our, uh, our audience. Uh, so there's a number of questions which are around exactly that issue, Emma, which is, <coughs> me, does this provide us with an opportunity now to change the way that we actually uh, do things uh, collectively in Australia. And we've talked about this uh, at the very beginning uh, in terms of the new social contract. Uh, you know, the fact that we've got this national cabinet uh, in Australia, for example. Um, so there's a question here uh, from Janet, which says uh, that uh, back in the 90s, uh, the Hawke government established uh, some roundtable working groups which developed policy on a, on a sustainable future. Uh, and the question is, is this now another opportunity to get past this sort of partisanship we have at the moment and, and bring together uh, groups uh, that can contribute to the same sort of uh, development of, of ideas uh, that address uh, the climate change issue, not just in terms of uh, reducing emissions, but in terms of also uh, adapting uh, society and uh, and perhaps get around this roadblock that uh, that you've just referred to, Emma. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the challenge that we always have here is that politics is inherently partisan. It is a contest of ideas. It, you know, ideas will be contested, fine. But does that mean that policy always has to be so highly contested? And at certain points in Australia's history, we have actually very effectively come together to agree a compromise solution forward that is in the national interest. I don't think there's anybody arguing that the current state of affairs in terms of um, the uh, uh, climate and energy policy, policy is 
um, best serving Australia's national interests at the moment, um, or is as 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 good as it could be. And with the greatest of respect to um, to uh, everyone who's been involved in trying to constantly find a compromised way forward at the moment in, in over the last ten years, and every initiative that's been put forward, we're still not where we need to be in terms of in terms of recognising where we need to get to. In fact, we won't even we can't even acknowledge where we need to get to uh, in terms of our agreements under Paris. We're still having a debate about the language that you use around whether you can or can't say that we need a, a net zero target by 2050. When you know that's kind of it's implicit in Paris. We've signed up to. It's what companies are signing up to. Uh, it's what investors are signing up to as well. So there's still a lot of um, sort of uh, political gymnastics, I guess you could say, that happens in the in the public policy discussion. You know, COVID, the discussion around recovery. I mean, this has to be an opportunity where we address issues to do with to do with um, the core emissions intensity of our economy. Um, and again, the IEA report that we talked about earlier. I mean, the, the top three things that it mentions are construction and property and energy efficiency. Uh, energy distribution networks and energy deployment type activities. This, if you asked 90% of investors in Australia about the things that they would be most ready to put money into right now or need to put money into right now, it would be along those lines because we know that the energy sector in, in Australia both needs modernising, it needs decarbonising and it needs investment. So you would think that there would be a few really clear areas where we could move quite quickly to build consensus um, and, and to, to bring some coherence to our national discussion around um, what does a sustainable economy look like for Australia for the next, um, you know, two, three, five, 10, 15, 20 years? Thank you, Emma. Anybody else want to contribute? No, I might uh, move on to the next uh, series of questions. There's a number of questions actually uh, relating to, uh, to the, um, the discussion around gas and uh, investment in uh, gas infrastructure in particular, uh, discussions around whether gas is a transition fuel, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so uh, maybe to sort of group those questions together, uh, we could have a question framed around whether gas has a role to play in the recovery process, uh, or is this something uh, that is, uh, is going to uh, cut across the other uh, issues uh, in relation to doing something about climate change. That's kind of a summary of the various questions that have been asked in that area and uh, uh, happy to take comment on that. If you like, I can start. I, I um, obviously have been quite involved in that topic uh, for my entire career um, and I participated in the Obama Council that led to the uh, creation of what ended up becoming an incredibly important part of the uh, US energy mix that um, in essence was an all of the above energy policy and an all of the above energy policy meant that you did the four things i talked about the fourth was undone which was the uh, carbon pricing mechanism but the other three were put in place uh, since then i've seen examples around the world where uh, the lowering of emissions through uh, and not debilitating industry on the way so uh, a worst case would be you know, I get to a, a zero emissions, but I've lost a million jobs, right? So we would agree that's not a very good trade unless I can create a million jobs. So that's why the word transition becomes very important. I've seen that now happen in the UK with their energy transition, and it's a sensible one that lowers emissions. And actually, frankly, is now they're now out of coal and they've replaced coal with gas. Now, they wish to go to zero emissions. They wish to go to the uh, net zero by 2050. They have those as goals. So they clearly are on a pathway to get to uh, zero uh, carbon burning in power stations and zero carbon in, uh, in uh, transportation. Um, to get affordable um, baseload power and to get affordable industrial feedstock for uh, inputs, uh, because 95% of all synthetics, and I'm talking about all materials, um, uh, things that go into the devices we're using today are uh, based off uh, carbon uh, and synthetic fuels. We live in an organic world, uh, it may, may or may not be in anyone's consciousness. So you need technology shifts, not just in the power sector, but in the industrial sector. To do that, you need R&D and you need to fund that R&D over long life cycles. So affordable solar and affordable wind solve part of the problem, but they don't solve all of the problem. You've got to basically find a way to sequester carbon affordably because you're going to be burning it for a while to come and you're going to have it coming out of smokestacks. That's a bad answer. So you need affordable carbon sequestration technologies. You need affordable hydrogen. Green hydrogen, which is electrolysis-based, has to have affordable power. Therefore, you've got to synchronize it with an input 
that actually gives you the output you want to give you the new input. That actually economically doesn't work unless you've got breakthrough technology. That's on its way. And you can see your way to green hydrogen within a decade. So how do you manage that transition? Well, you want to lower emissions on the way. So why keep burning the high carbon emitter? Why not use your low carbon uh, emitter and deal with that? Rather, than, Unless you want to use nuclear, by the way, which is the other pathway. A lot of the work that's being done around the world is, in fact, on safe nuclear. But if you don't want to have nuclear in your mix, then gas is the only thing that can get you from here to there and not lose all these jobs. And you've got to be committed to several things. R&D to replace it. It can't be the destination. It has to be the transition. So that's very key. The second is you've got to find a way to actually replace your industrial use. So it's not just for power. Um, there are other pathways, including hydrogen, but they are going to take time. You've got to have R&D that supports that so you can build, get all your synthetics. And when I say synthetics, I mean building materials. I mean things that we you know, use to live, things that we, our shampoos, everything comes out of the carbon molecule. So what we've got to do is find a way to get the whole of government approach to that. And I think it's doable and it's being done elsewhere. Um, Australia has lapsed into this notion of exporting all its gas taking the royalties and using it to fund the economy. If that's the way to go, fine. Well, how about we use those funds to fund the transition rather than to fund other things? If we want zero carbon, export all the gas, let other people burn it, fine. But let's use the money that we get from that to invest in R&D pathways to get affordable batteries, affordable hydrogen, and actually safe technologies that we can use for energy efficiency. So that's, that's as much as I can say on the topic in a short time. Thanks, Andrew. Anybody else? Look, I'll just say a couple of things, Ken, um, and it sort of picks up some of the comments Emma was saying earlier too about the difficulties in the debate that we have had for quite a long time now in Australia, um, the difficulty of finding common ground, um, and the debate about what gas's role in the transition is, has almost got some aspects of that attached to it in that you get some people who just have a kind of ideological opposition to the use of any kind of fossil fuel. And then at the other end of the spectrum, you have um, um, you know, the, the view that that's being sort of pushed by the fossil fuel lobby and therefore it's not really a, it's not really a, uh, a contributor to emissions. And, and what we really need to do is step back and say, well, what are we using gas for and what's its role um, in the transition? And there, is, there are definitely uh, roles for gas in the transition to a low emissions economy. Um, we see it already, um, uh, Andrew mentioned the, the role of Australia in providing gas to countries where the alternative might be a higher, higher emission source, so that's already one. Um, in Australia, there's a clear pathway where if you can use um, gas to help um, stabilise our electricity system, uh, you can actually get more renewables into our, uh, our electricity system as a result, so they can work together to get to the low emissions outcomes. It's not like you've, you've got a kind of competition going between the gas and the renewables to get the outcome. It's actually saying, well, what's the portfolio of things that we need to have there so that um, in the electricity sector, it's actually still firm and reliable and doing all the things that we need it to do, but also continuing on its trajectory to lower emissions. Um, and, you know, again, sort of the allusion I think Andrew made to the fact that, you know, it's another, it's also a pathway to greater use of hydrogen domestically. And that um, would be a part of the potential for Australia to harness its phenomenally great uh, renewable resources, concentrate them down into a form of energy that can actually be transported, um, which is hydrogen, and use that to supply the world a really low, uh, low, potentially zero um, emissions fuel. So, so there is a role for gas um, and it is sort of it is one of those it's an unfortunate thing in a way that um, that we are still ha having some problems and having the discussion about exactly how you, how we do that and how we do that to our benefit um, rather than allowing some of those more ideological positions to, to get in the way. Um, Emma. I'll just round that one out just in terms of saying that um, this debate around gas as a transition fuel has been underway for a while and so has the transition. It's not like we're debating starting a transition. We're actually well into it, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a question of what are we transitioning to? And when does that window close? When, how long is that transition? And when is it no longer viable as a transition fuel from either an investment risk perspective or in terms of a, a climate change perspective? And this is an issue that institutional investors who I represent are, are grappling with right now because they are long-term investors. 
So they are looking at putting capital into to investment decisions where they're having to work out where are we on that pathway? Where is the end? Uh, and what, is, what are the different sorts of investments? Where are the price points where assets are at risk of becoming stranded because of the structural change that we're seeing? So this makes them very, very nervous and invest a lot of time and energy into due diligence around every single investment decision that they're making. So this is not helped by the fact we're still having this sort of debate. And then just one other comment, because I can see, Andrew, you want to dive in, but I'll just finish my one other comment is that we're also not really acknowledging the fact that in order to bring in alternative sources of energy that are cleaner, we have to take some out of the system. And we also have a policy structure at the moment, which is deliberately keeping in old, inefficient, carbon intensive energy generation in Australia. Uh, and we're sort of trying to push both sides of the middle at the moment. And as a result, we're not really, we're not really going anywhere. We can't keep coal in and not make move for alternative energy sources in Australia at the same time. We have to take something out in order to make way for new cleaner investment to come in as well. So I, sometimes I think we've, we've forgotten the fact that more than 50% of our energy mix still comes from coal as well. Yeah, I was just going to, so uh, I, I just wanted to dive in uh, just to make sure that um, the, the discussion on power gets separated from the discussion on industry because it does get um, somewhat uh, diffuse when one looks at power for industry. So that, that's one thing that's important. But gas is used for industry direct, and there's no substitute for that. And so we need affordable gas. There's over 150,000 jobs in Australia directly tied to the use of gas as a feedstock. And with gas all exported and priced at international prices, those industries are dying. So now we're importing 40% of our cement. We're importing 90% of our fertilizers, our explosives, all the things we need for the other industries. So, so the industrial side of this conversation can't get lost in the transition. And in fact, there is no easy substitute. So we've got to remember that coal has no role in that. That's got nothing to do with coal. And for that matter, it's got nothing to do with oil. I mean, it's all about natural gas. And so one day you'll be able to use hydrogen for that, but the sea has to come from somewhere, you know, being a chemical engineer, you know, so where do you get the sea from? And so industrial uses of gas uh, actually sequester the sea and make it a useful product. Um, so you've got to remember that's part of the conversation, not just electricity. Absolutely it is. And a key part of decarbonising energy supply is the potential to create whole new green industries, industries that have not been viable in Australia for a number of years as well. I think one of the really exciting things about the, the technology roadmap is actually let's have a discussion around um, decarbonized manufacturing is an emerging economic opportunity. Let's talk about um, green steel. Let's talk about bringing back value adding activities into our economy. Um, where once we've dealt with the energy issue and the carbon intensity of the energy issue in whatever form that takes, but let's have that real conversation, then it actually opens up whole new economic opportunities and job creation opportunities as well that have to be part of the have to be part of the um, post COVID economic recovery discussion. This is it's a terrible event that we've been through. But, you know, are we going to, to really grasp the opportunity to really think through what do we want for our economy rather than just muddling our way from year to year? And are we going to set ourselves up for the next 20 years to actually be successful in a decarbonised global economy? Or are we just going to continue to do it on an incremental basis where we just keep importing every technology, every energy back again? Yeah, I think that's a good point to uh, finalise the discussion uh, that, you know, we do need to take lessons out of the COVID uh, crisis. Uh, we are in a position now where we can pivot uh, the way that the economy recovers and, uh, and move it into new directions. These opportunities come around only very rarely, once in decades or centuries. And uh, if we don't grasp this opportunity now, then it will be gone for a very long time. So I'd like to now thank uh, all the panel members, Joe Evans, Emma Hurd, Andrew Liberis. Uh, just to remind you that uh, we will be uh, posting uh, this on ANU TV in the coming days uh, and that uh, we have other sessions coming up uh, to uh, discuss uh, the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, not only on climate change, uh, but on world order and international relations more broadly. Uh, so thank you uh, for the uh, uh, audience, uh, for your uh, participation. Thank you for your questions. And we look forward to seeing you again uh, at uh, the other sessions, but also again next year, when hopefully with the COVID-19 crisis out of the way, we can come back live again. Thank you all. <laughs>